Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Carsten. And thanks to the organizers for organizing such an interesting uh, meeting and workshop. I hope next time we'll see you in person, all of you. So the plan of the talk is, uh, in fact, quite simple. Uh, I will try to uh, talk about the um, Pramorable course and the recent bunch of data that came out from the LIGO and Virgo collaboration. And then if I have time, I will uh, touch upon the subject of uh, Pramorable call and the, the recent nanograph, 12.5 year um, data that might be interpreted as gravitational wave signal. And um, I should also take the opportunity to thank um, all my collaborators here that um, have been in these two papers that I will talk about. In particular, my, my very good students, uh, PhD students, Valerio De Luca and uh, Gabriele Franciolini. All right, so the motivation is rather clear. Uh, we have now uh, this GWTC2 uh, bunch of data. We have uh, 50 uh, mergers in total. If we sum the O1, O2, and O3A, uh, data. So what I'm going to do uh, in the following is to ask the question if these mergers can be interpreted or not all of them, but uh, the, mo the large majority of them as uh, primordial black holes. So the assumption that I will be taking uh, in the following is uh, very simple. I'm going to assume that the primordial black holes are formed uh, by the uh, collapse of large overdensities in the early universe. There are many other um, possible ways to form uh, primordial black holes, but this is the assumption that I'll be working with uh, from, from now on. So in other words, the primordial black holes are just uh, rare events above some threshold, and we are interested. Uh, we are, you had lectures about this. We are only interested in the tail of the distribution. So a possible way to create these large overdensities is through inflation. I'm not going to talk about this. I'm just saying here that uh, what happens is that these large overdensities, as long as they are above some uh, threshold, they will uh, collapse. The mass of the black hole that will come out of this uh, uh, process is going to be more or less the mass of the horizon at that time. And the fraction of uh, the, the probability, if you like, of forming a primordial black hole will basically be the integral of a Gaussian if the, the Gaussian distribution can be assumed. Uh, there's been a lot of work recently on uh, going beyond um, the linear approximation, mainly the Gaussian approximation. Uh, let me just advertise a paper that we have been uh, written uh, and appeared last week on the, on the archive with um, Musco uh, and Gabriele Franciolini and Valerio De Luca, who be, um, in which we basically provided a very simple prescription, uh, given a power spectrum of the curvature superelevation to compute the threshold, which depends in fact on the shape of the power spectrum, and uh, a, a prescription that includes also uh, a lot of other nonlinear effects, like for instance, the one that comes from uh, the, um, the, the, the effect at, at horizon crossing, which uh, so far has not been included in the literature, as far as we know. So what are the properties of the primordial cause at formation? So first of all, we are going to assume, and that's our assumption from, the, from now on, that the mass function, the way the primordial cause are distributed is a log normal mass function. So there will be a, a mass MC, which is a central of the peak, if you like, and then a width, which is parameterized by, by this uh, sigma. Of course, this is not uh, a, a model independent uh, assumption. Uh, for instance, if the curvature perturbation is, um, is uh, flat or broad, as people say, then the, the mass function is, uh, is going to be peaked as well at the smaller scale that uh, you have in the problem, the first one that enters, re-enters the horizon, and then it goes, like, goes down like 1 over m to the 3 half. But uh, this is the assumption that we are going to, um, to adopt from now on. The mass function is going to be a log normal. The second uh, point that I would like to, uh, to uh, stress is the fact that when these uh, primordial black holes form from a collapse, they, they are not really exactly spinless because the, the peaks uh, of these um, over densities, they are not exactly spherical. Uh, one can use the famous result of this uh, Bardin et al. paper from 1986. And in fact, at, at first order in linear, in, uh, so in linear perturbation theory, because you have uh, torques, you can create some spin, some angular momentum for this uh, um, resulting primordial black hole. But of course, it's going to be quite small because the, the peaks are uh, nearly spherical. 
And in terms of this uh, dimensionless parameter, uh, the chi, uh, the spin is basically very small, it's 10 to minus two, multiplied by some uh, function which, which uh, um, inherits the, the, um, the information about the shape of the, uh, of the, of the um, density power spectrum. Okay, another, another property of these uh, primordial black holes when they are born is that the fact they are not clustered, they are Poisson distributed. And that's very easy to understand because of course they form inside the horizon and any correlation uh, will die off like the Laplacian over, over the horizon square, uh, over the Abore square, and therefore they are basically uh, Poisson distributed. This is also true when the, when the mass function uh, is, um, is broad. And the reason is very simple, uh, and there the, 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 the peak is given by the first k that will re-enter the, uh, the horizon. This is very simple to understand in terms of the discussion set theory, or in other words, that is highly, since primordial black holes are highly improbable objects, uh, it's, very, uh, it's very improbable to form a, a primordial black hole uh, inside, a, a small primordial black hole inside the bigger one. So, uh, or vice versa, a small one um, eaten by a bigger one. So in, in that case, um, also in that case, in case of a broad uh, power spectrum, this, uh, the, the basically correlation is non-vanishing. Of course, um, if you have a non-Gaussian distribution, um, things can change. If you have some primordial non-Gaussianity, which creates a crosstalk, a correlation between short and large scales, uh, things can, can be uh, clearly uh, different. Okay, so let me go directly to uh, the issue of, of primordial black holes and this GWTC2, the new, uh, the new uh, catalog that have been uh, provided us very recently. So first of all, one has to remember that the, the final goal is to understand uh, the, the mass or the chip mass of, the, of a merger. Uh, we can parameterize one of the two masses, for instance, with the ratio of the secondary over the primary mass. Then there is the chi effective, the, the distribution of spin over the angular momentum uh, vector. There is another uh, spin variable, which is called chi p, which we will uh, deal with it uh, a little bit later, which is in fact the projection over the plane uh, orthogonal to the angular momentum, which is because of GR effects will create some precession. But those are the parameters that, um, that I'm gonna call from now on event parameters, which, I have, um, which basically are measured by the collaborations. So once we have uh, a primordial black hole uh, that is born uh, because of some spherical collapse early in the universe in the radiation phase, let's say, of course, uh, they will form binaries. That happens, uh, those are called early, uh, early universe binaries because they form very, uh, very early in the universe before the matter radiation equality. And then of course, the, the, the BBH uh, parameters will, um, will change because of accretion and uh, mergers, okay? So there are two effects that we have to uh, account for before the, the final uh, merger event. So let me talk about, first of all, the accretion. Uh, and the, first of all, the accretion onto isolated primordial black holes. So let's assume that FBH, that means the, how much of the uh, primordial black holes are in the form of uh, dark matter uh, is smaller than one. So there will be another dark matter component in the universe. So when the, 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 um, the, the primordial black holes accrete, there will be basically a dark matter halo around, uh, around the primordial black hole that will, uh, will spur uh, farther the, uh, the accretion. And the mass of the halo is given by this formula, mh over three times the mass of the primordial black hole in units of uh, the redshift as given by the formula um, there. And then we are using for simplicity, the bondi oil accretion, even though you can uh, further uh, make further complications about this. And uh, it's important to understand that the accretion, uh, I know that you had lectures about this, goes like um, the cubic or the inverse cubic power or the velocity. So one has to basically um, study how this velocity is, uh, is, uh, is changing. But before uh, going to this, I will also have to say that um, accretion onto uh, primordial black hole binaries, when binaries are formed, uh, can be studied. In fact, one can use some adiabatic approximation and uh, opening the landau lipschitz book and one discovers, in fact, that uh, the, the secondary mass, the smallest mass in the binary, will accrete a lot because of the, of the dark matter halos and the presence of the, other, uh, of the other primordial black hole. And in general, what happens is that this parameter Q, which is the ratio of the, of the, uh, of the uh, secondary over the uh, primary mass, tends to one because the two masses tend to be uh, the same. 
And in general, I think as a rule of thumb, one can say that uh, the problem of the course uh, experience accretion when the masses are in or larger or border of in the ballpark of 10 solar masses. This is a kind of rule of thumb that you can, you can use. Of course, uh, at some point accretion will stop, uh, mainly because uh, structure formation will, uh, will start and, uh, and there will be the ionization epoch. And that will impact the, this, um, this um, relative velocity or the effective velocity, which is the sum of two uh, pieces. Uh, the relative velocity of the primordial cold with respect to the surrounding uh, uh, plasma and the sound uh, speed. And in general, one can parameterize uh, the uncertainties that go inside the accretion model using um, a parameter um, redshift cutoff, Z cutoff, which tells you at, at what redshift the accretion will, uh, will, uh, will stop. Okay. So we are going to use this parameter uh, and to vary it in order to, uh, to um, have an handle on possible uncertainties um, of the time at which the, uh, the, the accretion will stop. Okay, so once we have a, a accretion in the game, so then one can see, simply see how the initial uh, mass function will change. And here in this plot, you see the result uh, uh, given by MC, the peak of the initial um, log normal um, mass function given by 15 solar masses with a width of 0.5. And you see that when, uh, when Z cutoff is smaller, meaning that the accretion uh, lasts longer, then the effects on the, on the mass function is, um, is uh, larger, of course. You have a tail which increases at larger masses. A, a, um, the evolution is nonlinear. But in fact, when uh, it's important also to note that once you have uh, you have to fit the data and you want to fit the large mass tail of the of the LIGO Virgo events, of course, those have to be fitted, and therefore, basically, the response on the on the mass function will be to uh, move to the left or to smaller values the central mass MC. This is uh, the evolution of the Q parameter. So, as I said before, for physical reason, the Q parameter tends to go to one. Uh, how much it goes, it depends how long accretion lasts. So in, uh, in, on the top uh, right, you see a picture, which is the probability uh, of this parameter Q as a function of Q for different values of, uh, of the central mass and for Z cutoff equal to 10, which is more or less the, uh, the, the epoch of reorganization. And you see that uh, the, the larger is the uh, central mass, uh, the, um, the larger is the probability of, of having larger Q. So Q is pushed, is squeezed towards one. But in general, uh, one does not have to conclude that Q is always is a prediction of this primordial black hole uh, um, uh, uh, model plus accretion. This is not true. In general, the probability can be picked around values which are close to one, but not exactly equal to one. That will be more clear in, uh, in the following. Okay, then uh, also we have to account for the, uh, for the evolution of the spin. As I said before, the spin, uh, when the primordial black holes are born, uh, is basically uh, zero or at the level of a percentage, so 10 to minus two or so. But then of course, when, uh, when the primordial black holes will find itself uh, surrounded by the plasma, there will be some interaction and you can form a disk because at, and the angular momentum can be transferred to the primordial black hole, which starts spinning. And uh, one can solve the evolution of the, of the, of the spin. This is again a nonlinear problem, but uh, one can see that uh, when the ratio goes to smaller values, so to more recent epochs, even though you start from zero, then the spin starts growing because uh, of uh, this, um, this effect. And uh, uh, the central value will be, will be uh, zero because, of course, we are going to average over all possible directions. But what is interesting is that there is a correlation between uh, having large spins and uh, large masses because accretion are, is basically acting in the same direction as far as the spin and the mass are concerned. Okay, So that's, a, that's another prediction when you have accretion. Okay, once uh, we have dealt with accretion, the next step is to deal with the merger rate, including accretion. So as we said, we start from a Poisson distribution. Um, the binaries will, uh, will form, and then we can compute uh, what is the probability of the basic parameters that describe the binaries, so the semi-major axis and eccentricity. And once we have, uh, uh, we have it, we can compute the merger rate. 
And here, uh, I just wanted to point it out that the accretion will um, uh, makes, uh, make uh, hardens the binaries in such a way it changes uh, the um, uh, uh, above all the major axis. And then, of course, uh, larger masses will lead to shorter merges. That's a consequence. And all the other parameters are basically untouched by the, by the merger. Uh, of course, the masses change with time, but that's obvious. OK, so once we have all this uh, set up, then we can look at the data. Uh, as I said, we have 50 data, um, basically 50 mergers. We don't count all of them. So the, the, the dots, the, raw, the, the, the red dots here are those which um, we excluded because for a simple reason that uh, the LIGO and Virgo collaboration, they also excluded in the, in the analysis, in the papers that they published. So in order to conform to that analysis, we, we removed them. And also the, the, the points in red, they highlight the events which have, uh, a, according to the statement uh, in itself by the LIGO-Virgo collaboration, they are compatible with non-zero spin. Okay, so there are 10 events that uh, according to the collaboration, and of course you can look at the posterior probability there, uh, are compatible with no zero spin. This is important for what I, I'm going to say, I'm going to say in the following. So here what we did in our paper was to do a hierarchical basis um, inference uh, and using machine learning. So what we, we, we have, we have a bunch of event parameters, which are called theta here, are the masses of the two um, primordial calls in the binaries the chi effective and the redshift. And then of course we have some population hyperparameters, uh, which we call lambda, which are the mass of the central peak, the width of the distribution, the, uh, how much the primordial because uh, are in, in dark matter and zeta cutoff, as I, as I said, which parameterize somehow the, uh, the redshift. And uh, we computed the posterior distribution, which of course uh, needs some hyperparameter uh, prior and then, of course, by machine learning, we created the population likelihood. And then we also, uh, in, uh, also re-weighted by the single event likelihood. And uh, an important assumption that we are making here is that we are assuming that all the events we analyze, basically there are uh, 44, uh, all of them are primordial codes. So we want to ask, to ask the questions, is it possible that all the events that we are analyzing uh, are primordial codes? So it's a very strong assumption, but of course, it's an interesting question. So this is the, the population posterior distribution. As you can see, the central values, the best fit are uh, F FBH of order of 10 to minus 3. So the first thing that we can conclude is that PBH are not dark matter in this case, if we require that all the events are primordial calls. And also, uh, it's interesting uh, because we, we found a preference for, um, for accretion with a Z cutoff of order of 20. And I also want to stress here that this analysis uh, is, um, is also taking into account the spin, okay? And that's, I guess, the first time that has been done in this kind of, um, of uh, research. This is the probability distribution for the, for the spins, as you can see, for two different values of Q. So here you can see uh, very clearly that the average or the central peak, if you like, of the, of the probability in terms of the spins is, is, is zero, as we said, for chi effective, for instance. And uh, when we, uh, when we um, uh, decrease the value of Z cutoff, so we take longer periods of accretion, the probability will, uh, the, the width of the probability becomes uh, wider, meaning that, of course, uh, there is a preference to have uh, primordial um, black holes with, uh, with larger spins, for the reason that I explained uh, before. When the Z cutoff is sent to infinity, let's say, so there is no accretion, in, uh, in, pre in practice, you get a delta function for, for a chi-effective uh, peak around, around zero. Those are the, here uh, we show the, the population properties, uh, the, the, the probabilities. So for instance, you see the probability on the top left as a function of the, of the largest mass. And we also um, plotted here what the LIGO and uh, Virgo collaboration had for the, same, uh, for the same probability of what they call the power law peak uh, model. They have, uh, I don't remember, four or five different models to, to, uh, to fit the, the posterior distribution. Here on the top right, you see the same uh, for, the, for the Q parameters. As you can see, this uh, is not peak at around one. So the primordial core still have uh, a scenario allows the Q not to be uh, equal to one, but you see that uh, but there is a long tail, a, a kind of broad tail to uh, Q equal one. 
And also the second line of, uh, of is uh, are the probability for the for the spins. Here I want to point it out that those are the population um, um, probabilities. So there is no selection effect because when you account for the selection effect, the fact that LIGO sees uh, um, better larger masses, then of course the 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 the, the, the chi uh, will push uh, will be pushed towards non-zero values. Precisely because there are events that the, the probability that the LIGO Virgo conversion sees, which are which are not centered around around zero. And finally, the last uh, the last uh, picture is the the major rate as a function of the redshift, and the blue line is the prediction of the Pramora black hole. And here also we plotted again the same kind of LIGO Virgo um, uh, prediction for a given model. So this is not a, a, a universal prediction; is also assuming some power law. Uh, kind of model. Also, it's interesting to notice, uh, I, would, I would also stress it, that the LIGO-Virgo models uh, are not astrophysical. In order to do an analysis, a comparison between, a, a fair comparison between the PBH um, model and the astrophysical model, one has to do, uh, um, using Bayesian inference, for instance, one has to really take a, a real astrophysical model, because of course, when you have a real astrophysical model, the, the uh, the, um, the probability, uh, the prior probability for the event parameters are all correlated, like they are for the primor for the primordial black hole case, for instance. As I said, the spin is correlated with the mass, for instance, if accretion is there. And there have been two papers, one uh, yesterday and one today, which I cited there, that uh, are trying to to do uh, something uh, similar that we did for the primordial black hole. I just wanted to stress that once a, a comparison has to be made, one has to be uh, one has to do it on the same on the same ground. And finally, uh, once we have a prediction for the best fit model, uh, then we can ask ourselves if this is uh, okay with the with the present constraints. The answer is yes. Uh, basically, the, the 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 best fit is is allowed by the by the current uh, constraints. And also, it's important that since we find that FEBH is uh, of order of three ten to minus three, uh, the, the clustering I, I believe is not important there. Uh, in particular, because there are strong bounds from uh, from the accretion uh, from the CMB accretion, and then uh, and then there, this is phenomenon that happens at uh, around between three hundred and a thousand, let's say, in redshift. And then the rule of thumb to understand if, uh, if clustering is important is the one provided by in the paper by Inman and Ali Amud. I think Yassin talked about that in his lecture. And the rule of thumb is that, uh, uh, that uh, clustering is not important as long as FBH is more than Z times 10 to minus 4. If we take uh, Z to be, one, uh, let's say, 300 or so for the CMB distortion that we are getting, in any case, FBH is more than 10 to minus 2. And we found one order of magnitude smaller. So we are safe from that point of view. All right, so I think I, I, I have concluded. So the message that I want to leave uh, you with is the fact that uh, if we assume that all the primordial black holes are, um, all the events in the LIGO Vigo collaboration are coming from black holes which are primordial, uh, then um, we conclude that in fact, if that is the case, the primordial black holes are not the dark matter because, as I said, the BH is much more than unity. Uh, and uh, but it's still possible to have the, all the events in the form of dark matter, in the form of primordial black holes. And I will stop here. Thanks a lot. Yeah, we thank you <coughs> to Antonio. <coughs> there are questions. Um, one particular question from Kushik Dutta is. In the case when FP uh, when FPBH is one, so no other dark matter, how the equation story changes at the first part of your talk, or is is it that you ignore that you find in the second part FPBH should be on ten to minus four? Yeah. So so in other words, I mean we neglected from the very beginning because already the one uh, O one and O two data were giving us values uh, of FPBH much more than unity. So we were betting, if you like, on the fact that adding new data, um, because the mass range is more the same and the merger rate are always the same, more or less, uh, the value of FBH would have not changed. And in fact, that's the case. So we were not dealing with uh, clustering from the beginning. Of course, when clustering is there, as a, let's say that I answered this question independently of the data, if FBH is equal to one, then of course one has to 
uh, one has to account for the fact that um, that binaries will be in cluster. I think uh, you, Carson, talk about this this morning, and then there will be disruption and so on. And then uh, the environment that will be uh, that will be surrounding the binaries will be different. So most probably accretion uh, will be different. Well, I guess it will depend on the clustering length uh, compared to the boundary radius of the accretion. But I would bet that as far as accretion is concerned, not very much difference will will uh, will be there. But in our case, uh, in our case, we, we knew from the beginning, if you like, that uh, that the clustering was not playing a role. I would like to just make sure the you're talking a lot about late time equation too, and this is equation on balance on the black holes, I yes. suppose, and that only can play any role if f p b h is much smaller than a tenth or something like this. Yeah, so that, that's okay. Yes, that's true. Okay. But in any case, which is in the ballpark, uh, well, it's w very well in the, I mean, you know, larger than the, what we found. So that's okay. Okay. So let me uh, see. There was a question. Will the post equation by Patazarati Mayumda, sorry if I didn't get the name right the first time, will the post equation spin be different in the equation with axially symmetric, like as a disk rather than spherical? So he asked. Disc yeah, so yeah, so there are different regimes that one has to study for the spin. Uh, usually, the spin production is for uh, I'm talking about the primal because uh, it's very efficient if we are in the super editor regime. Uh, so when the when the m dot is larger than the corresponding value for the Eddington, and the answer is yes, it will be uh, slightly different. But that depends. Of course, it's a, it's a, it's an issue that uh, one has to study depending on the mass. Of the of the of the object you start from, yes. Mm -hmm. There is a question of Ajit Srivastava: If all LIGO Virgo black holes events are Pamali black holes, then most of them should come from the halo. I assume halo, uh, and less from luminous part or the luminous part of galaxies. Is there any evidence for this? Uh, you mean the halo? Which halo of the of the? I'm not sure I understand the question. I think I think it means the the halos of galaxies. And oh yes, yes, that's true. Well, uh, there is no well. I mean the the. Uh, I believe that no, there is no evidence as far as far as I know because of course uh, because of course, uh, I mean how they are distributed will need will need electromagnetic counterpart to to, to see anything like this. So, so I don't think that that has to be done yet. Has to be done. Yes, it's very difficult. Yeah. Yes, it's extremely we difficult. Don't I mean, know, as, as, we don't even yeah. know which galaxies they're in often. Exactly. Know, so. so I don't think we can say anything about this. Yeah. But then there's a question from Bernard Carr, which, uh, you know, I would like to have too. <laughs> um, is your conclusion consistent with that of Carsten? Of, uh, uh, yes, it is, because I don't see any, I don't see any, any, uh, uh, any contrast here because of course clustering as a rule of thumb is very important when FEBH is very large okay so uh, and in fact this is the rule of thumb that I believe one can use the one that I gave uh, FEBH more than z times 10 to minus 4 so I don't see any 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 uh, contrast about what uh, we are saying here here we are just saying that uh, the, the the model that fits all the possible uh, events have an FEBH which is smaller than uh, 10 to minus 2 by a factor of 3 or so. And there mm -hmm. we know that clustering is not, uh, is not, uh, yes. is not efficient. Mm -hmm. Notice also here that one has to be careful in taking into account the fact that also FEBH when accretion is taken care of, you have to, it's a function of uh, the redshift. That's the reason why here on the vertical axis is, is uh, computed z equals 0. Uh, so no, I would say no, because in any case, I have to say that if you want to uh, to use the clustering for whatever you, you you need, you also have now another problem to avoid the the, the bounds from the CMB distortion. Those those are you know those are very um, let's say they they are coming from physics at very high uh, redshift, let's say between 300 and 1,000, and there uh, you know the clustering has not developed fully and uh, and. Uh, so if you want to, uh, if you, I mean, my claim is that if you take FEBH equal one, my claim is that there is no way to avoid the CMB distortions anyway. So you are, you are in, a, in a bad shape anyway. I tell so you, 
disagree. I'm sorry, like I shouldn't be. Okay, that's again, fine. Then we can I talk. I can't later. disagree because it depends very much on the mass function. If the bulk of the dark matter is essentially in much lighter holes, and you only have a small fraction in those 30 solar mass, 50 solar mass black holes. Okay, but then, then that, okay. The, yeah, but then you have to, all right, but then the, the, but then you are playing a different game, right? Because then then you're not trying to fit all the data of the, of the LIGO Virgo, you're, okay, you, maybe you fit some of them, and, and then and the central peak is somewhere else, and you have only the tail. So it depends on the, yeah, I agree. It yeah, cannot be a universal, uh, yeah. okay. Sorry. Okay, so we have like thanks to you having the uh, talk very short, we could uh, uh, ask many questions, but we now have sure. passed the time, and and I'm sorry if there were I think there were one two more questions, but um, we have to move on to the next speaker. Sure. Thank you once more. Thanks to you. Uh,